Hi, I'm Mark Sklar, the fertility expert, and I keep getting tons of questions on Instagram, Facebook, private messaging, you know, regarding FSH levels and AMH levels and can they be improved or changed and what affects them. So I want to give you a little bit of information about my take on it um, and how I feel about both of those two things. So first, let's clarify a couple of bits of information. FSH is follicle stimulating hormone, okay? This is the hormone that's produced in the pituitary that stimulates your ovaries to produce more eggs or more follicles. Um, this is a indicator for ovarian, um, for egg quality, excuse me. <clears throat> um, it's been around for a long time. It's one of the uh, hormone tests that I trust um, because it's been around for a long time and I've seen its progress and how it moves and changes with patients over time. So um, the tricky thing that I find is a lot of uh, doctors, when they order FSH, for whatever reason, um, I found in the last year or two that they're not ordering other labs in conjunction with it. And it is very important that you not just order FSH, but that you order LH and that you order estradiol in conjunction with FSH. And not only that you order those three labs, but that they're done on a specific day of your cycle. So it should be run on either day two, three, or four of your cycle. That's the best way to get a very accurate um, and a clear picture of what's going on with FSH levels and egg quality. Now, um, there is a feedback loop. So this might get over some people's heads, but there's a feedback loop between estradiol and FSH, so they support each other. So if FSH is starting to rise, to lower it, the body will raise estrogen levels to push that number down. So you do need to see how they relate to one another. The other reason why we wanna have, uh, or another reason why we wanna have FSH run with LH is because we wanna see what the relationship is, the ratio between FSH and LH. We wanna make sure that it's a one-to-one -one ratio, and if, those, if that ratio starts to become wider, then that starts, to be an indicator for other hormonal issues, one of which can be PCOS. Um, so the other question around specifically FSH is, um, is it the end all be all? If it rises and it's, and, and it's too high, you know, what does that symbolize for me? So ideally we want FSH levels below 10. And for me, I prefer to have in conjunction with that, estradiol levels between 40 and 80. Um, when we start to see that, then I am, I'm very comfortable with where our, what our ovaries are doing and egg quality. As FSH increases, that just changes our approach and potentially might cause us to need a little bit more time in treatment or might influence what we recommend. Now, just because it's higher doesn't necessarily mean it won't come down or that you can't get pregnant. I've seen women with an FSH of 20 or 30 be able to, over time, not only lower those numbers, but get pregnant. So as long as we understand what the situation is and create a good plan for what you need, we can take care of that. FSH does fluctuate from month to month, or can, I should say, fluctuate from month to month. So let's not get caught up in what it is on any given cycle, and let's just take a, a bigger picture and take a step back. AMH, on the other hand, um, is a relatively new test. And I've seen a lot of clinics abandon testing FSH in lieu of AMH. And I'm not really a big fan of that. Um, not only do I not trust it, but because it's been around for a short period of time, I don't really, I don't have the same breadth of information and history to be able to track its progress. So AMH is an indicator, or other, sorry, otherwise known as anti-malarian hormone, is an indicator for um, ovarian reserve, how many eggs or follicles are left um, to be used in, um, and ovulated any given cycle. Now, let's all think about this properly, okay? Women start with a certain amount of eggs when they're born. A ton of those are already lost by the time they hit puberty, and every month we lose more as we ovulate. <clears throat> so, AMH should never rise, it should only decrease in over time, right? Yet in clinical practice, I see patients all the time with an AMH that's very, very low, and after treatment, we see it come up. So I don't trust it very much, um, and because of that, I've also developed my own theory as to what I think we're actually reading when we read FS, um, AMH levels. 
also I think there's a lot of factors involved in um, um, trusting the level of AMH that we see. One of those being vitamin D levels. So we've seen recently in uh, research studies that low vitamin D levels can cause low AMH levels, and as we raise vitamin D levels, that AMH will jointly rise with it. So I can't always trust AMH on its own, and oftentimes vitamin D is not run at all. In my practice it is, but oftentimes it's not. So let me give you a little bit of information as to what <clears throat> I think AMH levels are. Let's pretend this is a pool of all the um, follicles that are waiting in some small, little, quiet, dark place in the body to, um, to be moved on to the next stage of follicular genesis and eventually ovulated out. AMH, if, if it's a true number, should really be testing this pool of, of uh, follicles. Um, but what I believe, and this is completely my theory, what I believe is actually happening is that AMH is testing somewhere along this conveyor belt. Um, because if it was truly testing this number, or, or this pool here, we would never see that number go up. We would only see it go down over time. But what we see is that it does and can go up. And so what I believe is really happening is that AMH is testing somewhere along this conveyor belt line before it gets to the ovaries for ovulation. And what we're seeing is that there's a slow output of the follicles onto the conveyor belt um, because, and that's when we get low AMH levels for numerous reasons. And so if we can correct the hormonal imbalance, if we can nurture the body and bring more nourishment and blood circulation, that theoretically over time, um, we can see more output of these follicles onto the conveyor belt. And so we see more follicles on the conveyor belt, thus the AMH level reading will go up. Okay, so that's what I, I believe is happening here. Now, let's say you have a low AMH level reading. You do treatment for three months or six months or whatever it is that, you know, if you're working with me, whatever it is that we come up with, the plan we come up with, or if you're working with somebody else, the, the timeline that you guys give for that. Um, and when you retest AMH levels, that number stays the same, then I do believe that you are reading the correct number and you are getting a true reading for AMH. But I don't see that often. I actually see often that the AMH levels change and improve and go up. So that's my uh, take on um, how to understand AMH and FSH levels and uh, what it means. Uh, hopefully that was useful and helpful for you. I get that question all the time. Um, but if you've got more questions about it, please let me know. Um, add them to the comment area below and um, hopefully, you, hopefully this was helpful. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get more information on our upcoming videos. Thanks so much. I'm Mark Sklar, the Fertility Expert.